So, hello everybody. Um, I'm doing these videos uh, because I read on Reddit that people are looking for a little bit more information on late game Banished. They want to see more Let's Play with some uh, late game elements, seeing how things work in the late game. Um, I've gotten to the late game on a few different towns. Uh, one on my laptop. I'll probably load that save game over here to my gaming PC and do another video on that later. That one's actually the best town I have so far. But the biggest town I have so far, which has almost consumed the entire map, is um, on here. And let's give that a look. So uh, I, I sort of wanted to not just jump in here and go straight to the end game. Um, give a little bit of a feedback on how to get there. There are lots of people doing great videos on how to start Banished, how to get running your first uh, 20, 30, 40, even maybe even 100 population. But uh, from that point on, it seems like, uh, based from a lot of comments on Reddit and so on, um, and forums, that nobody's really doing videos past that stage. Um, so as you can see, I have close to 1,000 population in this town. And I've made a lot of mistakes in this town, which is one of the reasons that I want to do the video on this rather than my new town, which is designed much better. I learned a lot of things from that and fixed a lot of the errors that I made here. Um, so I wanted to start out with uh, how to build a town, how I, how I think of building a town. And believe me, I've made, uh, this is probably the fifth or sixth town that I made. It's the first one that really went well and started to work for me. Um, and the I, I made all the mistakes imaginable. And it was very funny and very rewarding gameplay experience um, <laughs> to see my villagers die in so many various fashions and not know how to save them. Um, so this is the first time that it really went well for me and I started expanding and really learning how to uh, buckle everything down. However, as I did that, I, I was still learning with this town how to get big. So along the way, I'm going to show you a lot of the mistakes that I made um, in some new gameplays that I'm going through right now. I'm actually going for a few more challenges. Uh, not using trading posts, for example. Um, not using uh, any crops whatsoever. Uh, that challenge, for example, the nature, uh, naturist, naturalist, or whatever it's called, that challenge. Um, so anyway. The way that I define building a town is basically I split into two types of clusters. Uh, the first type of cluster is the settlement cluster. I call it the settlement cluster. I basically focus that around a marketplace. So a marketplace uh, is the middle of that. And then I have around the marketplace, I want to put... Actually, this one up here is the best one. I can show you that one. The best design one. Around the marketplace... Around the marketplace, I put um, Taylor, Blacksmith, all the service provider buildings and uh, tavern later on and some houses. Um, chapel, school should go here, a hospital, all that kind of stuff. You can see that here. I have everything perfectly um, put here so that there's every kind of service, every product uh, being made right here within the vicinity of the market. From that point on, <coughs> I expand outwards into crops. So pastures, crops, orchards, all the same thing. Um, so those are sort of on the outer circle of the settlement cluster. That's what I basically define as a settlement cluster. A marketplace in the middle, all the production and services surrounding it, houses surrounding it, and then uh, crops, orchards, and pastures on the outer ring of that. And then, of course, I put storage barns and stockpiles. Those are very important. That's something that I did on this map uh, a little bit badly. I didn't put enough of those spread around. So, and then I want to put stockpiles and storage barns on the corners of all of these. You can see here, I even have two on that one. Of uh, the corners of this uh, sediment cluster. So that basically is what I call a sediment cluster. You can add some fisheries, maybe a trading post there. Uh, on the corners as well if you're near water. Uh, the other element that I call a cluster is the forestry or the nature cluster. And this is what I call a nature cluster. Um, it's basically hunting cabin, forestry, forester lodge, um, gathers hut, 
and one herbalist for every two or three of these that you make um, will suffice. Um, on this one, I actually doubled up on Hunting Cabin because it's quite a large area here. This area would have actually been better for um, a farming cluster, but I wanted to connect all of my farming cluster settlements via a forestry settlement, then to another farming settlement, which I find to be also the best way to expand around the map, to link your farming clusters via going through a forestry cluster. I didn't do that, for example, this one. This is where I started and I made the most mistakes, as you can probably see. Um, this one links directly up to another farming cluster and that's actually made a lot of problems for me. Um, but these actually work the best in tandem. Those two and then I'm actually going to try to do that again here. I have another forestry cluster south of my main starting point. Two actually. And then I'm going to expand into here and make another farming cluster here. So that's basically how I, I think of building towns. Um, if you're going to go for building everything, that is. If you're going to go for challenges, building just um, with no crops, no orchards, no pastures, then you would basically, uh, and that's one of the games that I'm playing through right now, um, would just make linked up uh, forestry, nature, uh, clusters spaced apart. You also want to have a storage barn, a stockpile, um, on every cluster that you've got, even the forestry clusters. Also enough homes for the people that work in that cluster to live there. Actually, I need another home here. That's something that I can do right now. Um, when you're placing homes, you see the edge right here that I've got on uh, that, I think that's an herbalist, yes. Um, make it, give it a space. That helps when you get a fire. Uh, if you have buildings right next to each other, like right here, I would put two houses right next to each other. Um, these two houses are actually right next to each other. And that's a mistake. Uh, you don't want to do that, because if that house catches fire, that one is definitely going to catch fire immediately. Uh, there will be no way to stop from doing that. If you have a space, uh, it usually has enough time uh, and a, enough of a chance that it won't catch fire from a neighboring building if there's a space in between. Obviously the more space the better, but I'm, I'm usually pretty happy with one space. That at least stops the spread of fire fast enough. And of course you want to have a well in every cluster that you've got. Another thing, um, woodcutters. I'll get to this in the next section, but uh, woodcutters are really good to have uh, on the outskirts of your forestry cluster next to the stockpile. You can see here that I've got a pathing, uh, very short pathing to his home, to the stockpile. Um, and that makes forestry uh, work very well, putting the wood in here and then him chopping up the wood to make firewood. Then that entire cluster has fuel. That cluster does, however, need to go to the next settlement cluster in order to get uh, coats and tools, clothes and tools, um, to go to the church, to go to the school, things like this. I don't put that stuff in a forestry cluster so that there's enough space for the forest. Um, I'll get into some of how those buildings work and what kind of ratios you probably want to use uh, a little bit later. But that's how I design towns in any case. Uh, another thing, and this is the last thing, build your bridges. Bridges cost a lot in the beginning of the game, but if you're, if you're starting out here, for example, I started out right here, uh, and I already built a bridge over here, I built a bridge up here, um, I think I built even that bridge as soon as I built this one. Build bridges next to, of course I built these as well, very early. Because here's something that happens. If you want to do remove resources, let's say you just want to remove these two trees on this side, and you even do that. If you were to do that, and you didn't have these bridges, and you were on this side of the map over here, your peasants, your citizens, would have to find the end of that river, which is actually, I think, at the bottom of the map. No, actually, it's over here. They would have to come around here, at the bottom corner of the map to get around that river to then come back up to this part and chop those trees that are 10 feet away on the other side of the river. Um, I cannot stress enough how important bridges are. Don't forget those uh, because you will make a mistake on you know cutting an area and just having one or two trees on the other side accidentally and before you know it all of your peasants rush to the other side of the map and they're dead.
they starve to death before they can even get back and eat. Uh, so the next part that I want to talk about is uh, crop alternating. Here we see that I've made a mistake. This is not good. Why is this not good? I've got walnut, pear, pear, walnut in four crops right here. I've got apple and apple right here as well. This is bad. I should actually have four different types of orchards right here. Why? Because when I get a pest in this walnut orchard, it's very close. It's actually only about three or four spaces away from the next walnut orchard. That's how the game calculates it, apparently. Um, I can tell the difference between this amount of space, between those two, and this amount of space, which is about six spaces between these two apple orchards. When one of these apple orchards gets infected, I can usually harvest and cut it before the next one gets infected. But when these get infected, they always spread. I can't do anything about it. They will spread to the next one. So wh what, what happens when uh, an orchard gets infected, and this, this works for crops, and this also works for pastures, is that any same type of orchard, pasture, or crop nearby has a chance of contracting that disease as well. It can also spread to other types. It has a uh, less likely um, likelihood of spreading to other types, apparently, but it has a much higher likelihood of spreading to the same type. So it's very good to alternate. And you can find that information, of course, in the help file, which is really great for this game. You go here, help file. So, sorry about that. Uh, crash. So, yes, this game is crashing a little bit. Uh, it definitely crashes on higher speeds. I usually play the game at 10 speed. I have slowed this game down to 5 speed because uh, the computer lags quite a bit. And I can definitely notice it while recording right now. But um, I wouldn't play the game at anything slower than 5. Uh, that's one of the gripes I have about the game is it's too slow. Um, 2 speed would... Prob 2 or even 3 speed should probably be the slowest speed. Uh, I just can't see playing the game at, at 1. That's It's a little bit crazy. Especially in the beginning. So anyway, uh, I was talking about the help menu. It's definitely very good. Access that there. That's very useful. And crop rotation. So uh, these four crops, for example, in this space, should actually be four different crops um, completely. And then, of course, these two should be different. The reason I have them there is because this was still a learning game. And I also have uh, ale, apple ale in this tavern. So I wanted to have some close by apple orchards. But I could have also done that by having an apple here and maybe one up here, which is actually what I should be doing right here. Um, so yeah, that is uh, that is basically uh, crop rotation. You want to do the same thing with crops. Corn and corn right next to each other is bad. Pumpkin and pumpkin right next to each other is bad. Like I said, these are mistakes. They should all be different types. You could make a 9x9 nine nine grid uh, of crops. I have some bigger crops over here and some bigger ones over here, for example. I have this one spaced out where I have bean and bean, wheat and wheat, cabbage, cabbage, pumpkin, pumpkin, squash, potato, pepper. So you can see they're very spaced apart between the same kind of crop. They're on the other end of the hex, which is far enough so that if one of them gets infected, the other one won't. This is the latest uh, farming settlement that I made, which is currently the best one. It's the best spaced out. Uh, my local tavern is making cherry. So I have, um, I believe I have cherry there, cherry there. So I have two cherry and the rest are single. I think I even have another cherry up here. Yeah, so that there's enough cherry for the, for the local tavern. So this is the way you want to do it, uh, not that way. I also, as I progress in the game, you can see these are smaller crops, crop fields. These are smaller here. Um, I originally went with 10 by 10. I tried to make 10 by 10, which has a space of one. I decided to go with 20 by 20, um, especially for the sake of livestock. I, I followed these guys quite a while, and I found that when you have a 20 by 20 pasture, you re reproduce at about three or four times faster than if you have a 10 by 10 pasture. You have this—you have actually better uh, workspace efficiency 
because it's a 20 by 20 pasture and not using up any extra road space or anything like that. Uh, whereas a 10 by 10, like these are 10 by 10, they actually use another uh, row for road space between them and so on and so forth. So I actually stopped making these small ones um, and started making big ones, especially for sheep and cattle. Uh, sheep and cattle just don't reproduce and don't produce as much side products, uh, wool and leather, when they're smaller. So I always now go for the maximum 20 by 20 pastures, or I don't build them. Uh, and you want to get to 20 by 20 because uh, anything less is not as effective. If you don't have the space for a 20 by 20, then build uh, a 15 by 15 crop or orchard, which is the max size for that. Um, here, also crop rotation, uh, pasture rotation rather. I have four chickens in a row. I get infected in one of these chickens quite often actually. You can see actually I killed them all off a while ago and I haven't put them back on. So let's do that. And the reason that these are all dead, even these over here, is because I didn't rotate those. I didn't stagger them. And these three are all chicken as well. So when one of these gets infected and one of these gets infected, they all get infected because they're right next to each other. Uh, same with these sheep. These cattle are actually sitting well. If they get infected, I call, I call them off. I kill them all off. But uh, this cattle over here won't get infected. And that's actually how they should be done. If you want to put a bunch of pastures together, like I actually did down here, I have cattle, sheep. Uh, this one should I, I should actually change to cattle and that one to sheep to stagger it even better. So um, that's how you should do it. And then of course I made two more chickens which actually shouldn't be there next to each other but I use the spare space for chickens the ones that are smaller and not 20 by 20 chickens seem to do pretty well uh, regardless of what size even if it's a little bit off so that's uh, crops uh, and crop rotating the next uh, section I want to go to so the next section I want to go to is uh, talking about workers and types. Uh, so when you're making your forestry cluster, foresters are good to have in every forestry cluster. They maintain the forest, they make it healthy, um, they call the old, old ones and they replenish them. Um, and they, they also make sure that you're only chopping the oldest trees. Um, the older trees also grow, have a higher likelihood of growing herbs around them, so you don't want to be cutting trees that are too are are not really at their their oldest stage that need to be chopped down and the game has some kind of mechanic with that so forestries do a good job of keeping your uh forester lodge keeps your forest healthy um a hunter cabin uh gatherer's hut that's what i define a forestry cluster as bare minimum forester lodge hunting cabin and gatherer's hut for every one or uh i would actually for every two or three forestry cluster I put an herbalist and I find that that works pretty good for this really large area I also doubled up on hunting cab uh, cabins I did not uh, double up on gatherers huts however um, I wish I could but I found that when I double up on gatherers huts uh, each of them actually works at half efficiency so it ends up producing more or less the same because one full gatherers hut will gather all of the herbs and everything in that area by itself so doubling up doesn't actually increase the efficiency. Gatherers huts I find to be the best pound for pound, person for person um, food production uh, in the in the game. They also produce a variety of different foods, um, roots, mushroom, and onions. So you have a little bit of a variety from one building, and they do it extremely well. Hunters cabins give you the leather in the early game before you have cattle. If you're doing a naturalist game. You need to have hunter's cabins a little bit more because you don't have cattle, most likely. Especially if you're starting on a uh, hard difficulty. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, play this game on any other. It's not as fun in the beginning. Um, so yeah, uh, you can double up on hunter's cabins, but you can't usually double up on gatherer's huts. Fill up your gatherer's huts. Fill up your hunter's cabins. Uh, you only need about half of the workers in the forestry lodge. If you need more wood flowing in you can maximize them out. Uh, I don't really need more wood, so I should actually have half. I'm just doing really well on population here, so I pumped up a lot of people. But I should actually pump that down a little bit more to, let's say, 24, 26, or something like that. Um, houses. You want to have houses next to there as well. And then, of course, uh, I talked about that a little bit before. Woodcutter. 
as part of that. Uh, if you have one woodcutter per uh, forestry cluster and you use forestry clusters as links between farming clusters, then it's a very, very good equilibrium with one woodcutters in the linking forestry cluster between two farming clusters. It works very well. Um, I've gauged these and the linking between these and also this one down here uh, for quite some time and it's perfect. It, it perfects out the equilibrium. It even makes a little bit of a surplus and that is why I actually use firewood as one of my trade sources. I use that extensively to buy up all of uh, all of the crops. I actually don't need trading posts anymore. I bought all the crops already. Um, but they're good to have. I think I read in the help file that they increase happiness a little bit. So uh, I'm also going f to finish one of the achievements of having, I think it's five trading posts. Whereas I have um, 18 divided by 6, so I have three trading posts right now. I need to build two more to get that achievement. Um, herbalists, max those out. Only build one for every three farming cluster that you've got. Uh, and it works pretty well. Keep a pretty steady supply of herbs. Um, traders, uh, you only need one trader per trading post. If you have a boat coming in that's got some supplies that you want to buy urgently, and you don't have your supplies for trade in your trading post yet, pump up your traders to get to fill those inventory in. And then once you have that, and once you make the trade, pump them back down to one. You only need one trader in a trading post. Set the inventory that you want to trade and let it be. And he will fill it up over time slowly enough. That's basically how this game works. A lot of the functions in the game, you're gonna wanna have them trickling in slow. Sometimes it's better to have, if you have a build order set for 30 or 40 buildings, it's better to have 10 bu builders. Because you don't want to have all those buildings built all of a sudden. Uh, then people are going to move in, you're going to have a huge influx of jobs. That's sort of how the game works. So you need to trickle things in, you need to gradually grow. Even if you want to build out a settlement and place all the buildings, don't, don't make the maximum amount of builders. Put a third of those builders and then they will slowly build that settlement. Um, so yeah, services, service buildings, there's no point to build a chapel unless you're going to put a cleric in there. There's no point to build a school if, unless you're going to maximize it with a teacher. So all the service buildings, the hospitals, the chapels, uh, the brewers, all these people, the blacksmiths, the tailors, only build those and keep them full. There's no other point to have them. If you make a surplus, trade it. If you don't need trade anymore, well, then you can expand if you have a surplus. That means you can expand, you can grow bigger. So uh, those buildings are really a waste unless they're always working and you're using up that uh, supply. So um, yeah, uh, stockpiles and barns. You want to have stockpiles and barns uh, at every corner of your town. It's even if you have a market as the center of your settlement, your farming settlement, uh, even if you have that, you definitely, in that case, want to have at the corners of your of that settlement uh, storage and barns. Right here, you can see I have <laughs> storage and barns. This is something that I learned late, and I didn't design this very well, but I managed to squeeze these in in appropriate locations. Uh, I even had to put two here because I get so much food, and you can see I have two full storage barns there, <laughs> and that one's even overflowing. Um, these are the kinds of problems that you run into uh, when you don't design your uh, town well, which I didn't design this town very well, especially this area, the starting area. Uh, I don't typically have that. I have a little bit of overflow. I should actually grow this town quite a bit. I need to put another 200 population in here. Um, so that's the services, and that wraps up this section. So, uh, this section I just want to give my review on Late Game Banished. What is Late Game Banished? Well, Late Game Banished is basically copy and paste of the same thing. That's, it's a little bit boring, it's, a little, it's not as exciting as I had hoped the game would be, but um, for what it is, it does it very well. Um, you basically are at the end game as soon as you have one, uh, one settlement like this, like a farming settlement with two linked um, forestry settlements or some combination of three linked settlements. When you have three linked settlements with at least one full service provider, 
uh, settlement. That is to say, chapel, school, tailor, smith, uh, all these kinds of production and so on, a boarding house, hospital. Once you have one of every type of building in at least three linked settlements, you're pretty much at the end game. Because from that point on, it's pretty much just copy and paste. You pretty much just make a settlement here and you set it, you get it to an equilibrium and making it uh, uh, function sort of by itself, linking a little bit up with its neighbor settlement. Um, and then you expand by continuing to make those little cluster settlements. Uh, and that's the game. That's, that's pretty much all it is. I, ha I really hope that they expand a little bit and make more, um, let's say, technology. He said he didn't want to make late game technology. Uh, I think he should. I think that maybe could be uh, a mod or something like that that makes technology that you can pay for at the trader, for example, or maybe make another building where you can research technology. And it, and it should take years. It should take lots and lots of resources. It should take years of time to research, you know, uh, gain 1% on your efficiency of, uh, of um, or 5%, let's say, on, on your harvesting, something like this. Uh, gain resistance to disease. Uh, you know, improve tools beyond steel, um, things like this. These, when he when he says that he doesn't want technology in the game, he's he's sort of contradicting himself though, because this is an example of basically technology, where you build up a supply chain that's a little bit more advanced than the previous one, and then you can build more advanced products. That's what technology is, and he already has that in the game in the form of the tailor and the blacksmith. Uh, you can build. Uh, steel tool and iron tool so I think he should just continue along that route because that is something that will add to the end game quite a bit managing map space that's really part of the challenge of this game is managing map space for example I started here and I made a big mistake with this quarry that's taking up a lot of space right next to my main settlement that should be used for something else um, those are the kinds of mistakes that you'll make in the beginning Later on, when you figure more out, you'll start putting your quarries and your iron mines on the edges of town where uh, you're, you're not going to be building a lot of extensive stuff anyway. Um, and you'll start learning how to spread out. Oh, look at here. I've got, um, I've got an infect, uh, infestation here in Pecan. So I don't have any... Well, I have another Pecan, but it's a whole field away. So it should be pretty safe. So that one, just to keep it safe, cut it. Um... So, tech is something that I think he sh he's already put in the game, even though he said he didn't want to put it in the game. I think he should continue with that. I think he should develop that a little bit more. That would make end game a little bit more viable uh, and a little bit more than uh, copy-paste of the same exact thing. So, um, however, this is not a city builder. A lot of people have been talking about how they want features added to the game. They want smarter villagers that don't take resources from here or there. Uh, I think that is uh, not the kind of game that this is uh, and it was clearly stated by the dev that that's not the kind of game that he's making and I like that. I like that the villagers in this game are dumb. They do what you tell them to and if you tell them to do something stupid like harvest this area when you have no bridges nearby and they need to cross water, they're gonna die. Um, that's part of the challenge of the game. That's part of the, uh, the game mechanics which are very well built, very simple to learn and challenging enough to keep you thinking throughout the game as you're building and as you're expanding. Um, so I really like that part of this game. Um, expanding is hard. So this is actually what I consider the only flaw in the game right now. When you want to expand, and I'm going to give you guys an example of this. So for example, I'll slow it down because it's lagging a little bit. Um, when you want to expand to a corner of the map, especially when you're playing on a large map, this area, for example, I want to build a new settlement in this area. So I've already built a fully functional uh, farming settlement right here next door. I've got storage barns. So I had to cut out there for a second. It was lagging on recording. So picking up, um, I've got storage barns here stocked full of food. Now what's going to happen? And I have another forestry settlement down here linking up as well. What's going to happen when I do this? What do you think? I need to clear all these resources to make space for a new settlement, a new little cluster here. Now, I've got 77 laborers. I've got a few hungry people, and that's you're going to see why. I've got 200 farmers, and half of my farmers are now going to die over the next five years. 
and pretty much all my laborers are going to die over the next five years collecting this. Why? I've got thriving settlements right next door, but yet when I send to collect some resources, there's a stockpile right here, there's food right here, there's houses right there across on the other side of the hill. Half of my extra population that's available to collect these resources over the next five to ten years while they collect this is going to die. Why is that? That's because the game has a serious error in its design. And that error is very simple to fix. So I hope the game developer fixes this. Um, I do indeed consider this an error. Uh, I don't want to stress that enough. So this is what happens. Here's my map. I'm up here on the map. Down here are a bunch of farms. Down here are a bunch of farms. Here's a bunch of farms. Now, farmers act as resource gatherers in the off-season when the harvest is not coming in. That is to say, in any time other than late summer through early winter, farmers are effectively laborers. They will go and collect resources for you. So all my farmers right now in the spring, well, some of them are planting. So in the spring as well, they're planting. So aside from planting, when they're done with that, plus all my laborers, are going to go out here and start collecting these resources, harvesting these resources. And what's going to happen... I'm going to pause this. What's going to happen when they go out here and they collect all these resources? Well, the farmers that live down here are going to walk all the way across the map, because that is all the way across the map. It's diagonally all the way across the map. And by the time that they get here, they're not even going to have time to hack at a tree or a piece of stone more than once or twice, they probably won't even cut down the tree before they get hungry. They will then be starving with the starving status and they will have to travel all the way back here to their home to eat. That's how ridiculous it is. That's why this is indeed an error. So they're gonna starve by the time they get back to their home and find some food. Uh, and that is how you kill off your entire population by basically just trying to expand to a new town. That's what's happened in this game when you try to expand, especially on the large maps. Um, so that is basically the challenge, the big challenge for um, the end game in uh, Banished. Unfortunate, but that's pretty much where the end game is throttled right now. So um, that's uh, that's my thoughts more or less on uh, Endgame, late game banished. It's a sandbox. That's very clear. It's not a city builder. It doesn't have AI. It doesn't have uh, evolution. Uh, it is just a sandbox survival uh, simulation, um, and that's good. But I think it should also be a little bit more complete. Uh, it's it's a very amazing feat that one developer built this. Uh, but it's also very obvious from things like this that the game is is a little bit shallow in these kinds of places. Uh, you can definitely see that. So um, that's my thoughts on uh, Late Game Banished. So my overall thoughts on Banished. Um, I just wanted to go. Uh, this is a wrap up of the series, a uh, quick series of videos, and give my thoughts on it. Um, first of all, the bad. So, Banished is way too slow. If you play this at one speed, you are literally going to be spending years playing this game. Um, it's way too slow at one speed, especially for a simulation like this, especially for the way that the mechanics in this game work. One speed is just incredibly, incredibly slow. I can't play this game at anything less than uh, five speed usually. I'll go to two speed if I need to take care of a disaster. One speed is just I don't even use it. So um, the UI uh, needs more efficiency. It needs more efficiency in ways to jump around and control things. For example, if I want to change all of my tailors or make sure that all my tailors are making warm coats once I get wool production coming in, I can't do that currently. I either have to go here and jump around and book and tag all of my tailors and then hop to each and every one of their um, uh, places to see what they're making and make sure that it's the right thing. Or 
uh, the town hall has some features that you can use um, as well on uh, production uh, rather overview you can jump around to the farmers and all the different production units um, but that's also extremely uh, tedious that's the best way that I found um, it's not bad but there's just a few little things that could be more helpful uh, in the game so uh, there, there would be really nice also a feature to basically set production of all of your tailors to a specific type. Maybe you could do that in the town hall or something like that. Set production of all of your tailors to wool coats or your blacksmiths to steel tools, things like this. Um, there is no end game. I already talked about that a little bit. There's really no end game to this at all. Once you get to a certain point, you just start over and you, do, you go for some new challenges or something like that. Achievements, you try to do some different achievements. Um, that's pretty much the extent uh, that this game is at. The good. So, what do I think is good about this game? I think a lot is good about this game. Um, it's an amazing feat for a single developer. That's definitely true. And I think we all give him props for that. Uh, however, when you're selling a game for 20 bucks, you have to compete with other games that are sold for 20 bucks. It doesn't matter at the end of the day if you did this by yourself and you can, you know, sort of have that as a tagline on your game. That still will not sell your game. Um, there are a lot of things that are still lacking. The depth of this game, the end game, um, the continuation, all this kind of stuff. It really does show that you know one developer or, or, or too few developers made this. Um, and hopefully that will be taken care of with mods. He has made it very clear that he's going to make um, a modding, make the game open to modding. So I think that's something that the community can pick up on and sort of flush out and make that happen. So I see a lot of promise in the game, but in its current state, being very newly released, uh, it's not there yet. Um, really well built simulation engine. Wow. Uh, a lot of people try to make simulation engines and they really fail at it. Uh, they either get too complicated, they make things that are too confusing, um, they make things that aren't logical, that don't work in tandem. They make sort of loops that go off on tangents where there's no way to cut them off. Um, but this simulation engine is really well-rounded. It's like a full circle and it fully ties into itself. Uh, it really comes home a 360 degree loop. You've got a very complex but easy to learn simulation engine. It's simply complex. It's very beautifully done. Um, you, you always, you can figure out the game, especially with the tutorials, relatively easily. You can learn the game really quick, and uh, I definitely suggest doing the tutorials if you haven't. Uh, I did them, all of them, and they're actually quite quick, quite fun, uh, and very well done. Uh, some of the best tutorials I've seen in any game um, really help you get into the game. So the simulation in this game is really well done. I uh, want to give him extra props on that. Um, the UI. Now, I... I ragged on the UI a little bit and now I want to actually give props to the UI because the UI is actually incredibly well done. All of this, uh, all these icons, their ease of access, and the function keys that you have here, um, the customizability of the UI that you can drag around the windows that you want, set them up how you want them, is phenomenal. A lot of game developers should take uh, tips from this guy on, on that aspect. Uh, that was incredibly well done. Um, the challenge. The challenge of this game is great. Uh, the challenge in this game is by game design, which is something very fragile, game design. Um, I've created a few games myself, uh, and I have a little bit of experience in that, so I can definitely appreciate the game developer's um, intuition on creating ga good game design. Challenge by game design, not challenge by confusing the player, making it hard to understand things, making it hard to figure out how things are done. It's easy to figure out how things are done after you play a little while, and the game design makes it challenging. So that's another beautiful, beautiful aspect of this game. So that pretty much wraps up my view on, uh, on Banished. And uh, I wanted to quickly jump to another, um, another town and show you um, this one really quickly. So I said that I had learned a little bit from this town that I had built and I tried to improve upon that a little bit in future towns. So this is a town that I just started building a few hours ago and like I said I play on 10x speed um, there's especially when you're starting out there's no other way to play 
So this is a town where I'm going to go for the challenges, the achievements on having no trading port. I have a hard start. I'm on. I'm starting on hard. I always start on hard. I don't. Uh, after the first few games where I died miserably and I was a horrible noob and I figured things out, I only start on hard with disasters on. There's no point not to. Uh, I I I want to try the harsh climate as well. I, I'm trying that on a new game right now uh, to make it super super challenging. But this game, I started right here. I started out building the Fisher Hut, um, getting this little forestry cluster going, hunting cabin, gatherer's hut, um, a few houses, forester lodge, and then I expanded here. I already made room for this market when I had already built my second forestry cluster. This game, I am going to go for having no crops, no pastures, no orchards, uh, simply using forestry, fishing, no trading posts, um, and I, I won't be able to get any seeds anyway without a training post which I actually just found out a few minutes ago when I was playing that I'm not going to be able to make any ale which is really a bummer no beer for the masses in this one uh, because I won't be able to get seeds to plant orchards and I won't have any fruit uh, although you know what I just thought about I think you can make ale with berries so my gatherers can actually make um, ale yeah Hey, learn something new every time. Uh, yeah, so that's great. I'm really happy about that. Uh, we're going to have a big party here soon. So uh, this is another uh, way that I want to uh, build a map out. And I did this a little bit smarter. Like I said, I started here. I'm building forestry clusters. This entire map will be consumed of forestry clusters. That's all I'm going to build here. And then between forestry clusters, I'm going to have centers with the production. So between, you've got one in each corner. One, two, three. I've been thinking about doing something up here, but it's not really big enough for a nice forestry cluster. I might do a small one, or I might just do quarries here. I'm not sure. Um, and then the market in the middle. So that's basically uh, one of these new games that I'm doing right now. Uh, and that's, that's a, it's a good example here of how to get that up and running. So... Um, yeah, there's, there's a good deal of things to do if you want to go for the achievements and get them all locked away. Um, oh, I didn't show you the, uh, the bridge. Bridges, I love bridges. Bridges are a phenomenal thing. Um, you want to build uh, some amazing bridges. So I, I want to put this in for uh, my entry into the contest of Longest Bridge probably won't win um, I'll figure out I'll find another map that's got a winding river that I can build a, a bridge all the way down the river which would be pretty nice but that bridge right there is fairly long and that bridge I believe that bridge is uh, probably one of the longer ones right there I believe I also have a double bridge here which uh, it's quite nice. So you guys can count how many segments, how many stone uh, support beams these bridges have. Um, there's a little contest, uh, I believe, going on with how long to build bridges. Whoever gets the longest bridge is going to either find two uh, lakes, horizontal or vertically stacked. Unfortunately, these two lakes are diagonally stacked. It's too bad. Or they're going to find a river that goes straight enough horizontally or vertically that they can build a bridge all the way down the river and um, if any of you find a map seed that has that feel free to post on the comments I would love to play that map seed if you want to play this map seed the map seed is right here go ahead have some fun so that's the wrap up for my uh, little series on late game banished, how it progresses, my thoughts on what needs to be done. I hope you guys found it useful. If you want anything else, if you want me to post videos on any other kind of aspect of the game, post in the comments, let me know. Have fun.